Well, hello, everybody. I'm Peter Woodis, Director of Energy at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, ISD, and we've been analysing and discussing the impacts of COVID-19 and the crisis on clean energy transitions for some weeks now. Um, today, I'm joined by my colleague Yvette Garasimchuk, the lead of our Sustainable Energy Supplies pillar in the Energy Programme, for a discussion which I hope you will find useful as you look to define your responses to uh, this ongoing crisis. So Yvette, the, uh, the situation in Geneva is pretty hard. We've been hard hit by the virus. There's been a lot of cases, a lot of tragic loss of life. Um, on the positive side, it seems the curve is now flattening. And although we've lost all our links with France around and I haven't been able to um, go over to France and do my shopping as usual, um, it's been very noticeable that all the, the, the nice cheeses and so on that I like uh, are being available in the Geneva shops and none of the supply chains have been broken. Um, how's things looking in, in Moscow? Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Russia is following uh, the European trajectory. We're behind it by maybe three or four weeks. Uh, and uh, there have been some disruptions uh, in supply chains because we are very much linked with China. And um, one thing uh, that I really like but disappeared uh, from the shops is uh, ginger and lemons because they were right. shopped a lot uh, from China. So I'm now using substitutes. <laughs> Very good. And I guess sort of closer to the issues we normally think about in the energy program is um, the supply and demand of um, energy sources. So um, what have you been noticing that's happening on the energy supply chains um, from, from the COVID crisis? Oof. Uh... I mean, unlike uh, toilet paper that people really um, shopped uh, and demanded, uh, all energy is now uh, um, experiencing lack of demand. So it's hard for fossil fuels. Uh, oil prices dropped uh, by more than a half. And it's also hard for renewables. Uh, there is now competition uh, for investment, uh, for buyers, actually. So it's going to, yeah, so it's a buyer's market. And I think we're seeing one of my observations around sort of the, the stimulus and the bailout packages have been talking, people have been talking about now has been the heavy level of competition there is from all levels of and all types of energy production um, for government assistance. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that from oil, from gas, from coal. Um, and I, mean, I, th I think one of the concerns here now is that decisions made by governments today in response to this crisis could fix us and lock us into the ways we produce and consume energy and emit carbon you know, for years and per perhaps even decades to come. Um, is that how you're seeing it too? Of course, I mean, it's, it's human tragedy uh, and uh, immediate response to the health crisis now is paramount, uh, but also uh, everything we do, uh, now has profound uh, effects for future generations. So the future is un in our hands and it's not only about washing them. Uh, and I'm really worried about uh, some of the uh, decisions we're making now because they have such big implications. No, that's interesting. So how do you feel that clean energy transitions can support those vulnerable people who are now suffering in the COVID-19 crisis? It's in a way the same self vulnerable people that suffer from climate change and uh, from lack of energy access. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, people uh, in poor households, uh, in uh, remote places and also in not so remote places in bad urban conditions in developing countries. It's governments and countries uh, with lack of capacity uh, on the whole. Uh, it's also elderly people because they suffer from uh, air pollution, uh, from fossil fuel combustion, for instance, and that made them more vulnerable to uh, COVID because uh, air pollution causes non-communicable non uh, diseases, respiratory, cardiovascular, diabetes, and many, many other uh, uh, inflictions, aff afflictions, sorry. Uh, and uh, it's also uh, very sad because uh, 
some of uh, uh, the uh, elements of this crisis could have been avoided. Uh, and it's true for both climate and the health crisis. For instance, subsidies uh, to fossil fuels, uh, to coal power have been uh, causing some of these problems, but they were also wasted uh, resources. Uh, and uh, uh, we know that uh, if they had been uh, used differently for healthcare, for education, that would have made us more resilient. No, I couldn't agree more. And I think another sort of opportunity we've had that we perhaps missed in the past, but now perhaps have a chance to move back to as well, is just on the creation of jobs. I think it's mm. we hear in all these stimulus packages that you know why not think about um, upscaling the, the the sort of performance of of the buildings that we live in and that we work in through energy efficiency and that, but. I think there's lots of other job creation opportunities and reskilling opportunities through distributed renewables to, for more access, through construction of low carbon infrastructure, even things soil remediation, uh, dealing with some of the extractive sites that are they're heavily polluting, orphan wells in Alberta and Canada and other things. And, and a lot of these are so sort of labour intensive um, that they could help sort of generate the jobs that all countries are now looking for um, as they as they think about the economic recovery. And once they get, uh, once they start flattening the curve and moving through, it's also, I think, very instructive, I think, to, to look back, and we discussed this before, looking back at some of the, the previous crises and how countries reacted. I think South Korea's stimulus uh, package response um, to the 2008-2009 financial crisis, where a lot of money went into river restoration and tourism sites and energy efficiency and green transport, I think it's been held up as, as one that was very successful. Some of the work that um, ISD's energy program has done with the government of Denmark on energy swaps, uh, sort of taking savings and putting them into clean energy by, for example, moving money from kerosene subsidies to solar energy, it's also been very effective. Um, and you know, there are all these sort of just transition opportunities. And I think as we're going to look through, uh, as we look forward into these economic, into the economic recovery, it, a lot of it's going to be about jobs. But I think Something that, that's been very strongly on my mind, and I think we've, we've discussed before and, and perhaps even disagreed with before, is you know, what do you think about renewables? Will, will, their, will their growth in renewables be sort of positive, positively affected by this crisis or negatively affected, or perhaps it's too early to say? I think it's going to be uh, more growth in renewables, but slower than if we hadn't had the COVID crisis. Uh, so uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, disruption of supply chains before uh, and a lot of renewable energy equipment uh, has been provided by China but of course also by uh, by some uh, other countries, uh, Germany, Denmark uh, and uh, uh, we also have seen some countries uh, even saying that uh, renewables are <laughs> Uh, not an essential service in this situation and curtailing renewables. Uh, but I'm also thinking of uh, the European examples and in particular about the UK and uh, uh, Germany, where in the first quarter of this year, renewables provided a lion's share of electricity. It was 45% in the UK in Q1 and it was 52% in Germany. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, like a paradigm shift uh, with uh, the cost of renewables being so low now. Uh, certainly um, the growth will be uh, smaller, but it won't be uh, stalled. We've seen you know, incredible quick um, reductions in the price of oil on the global market. It was under $20 at one point. It was negative in some markets at one point. Um, people were having to pay to get their oil moved into storage because uh, the stores were largely full. And you know, one of the things that we work on very strongly at ISD Energy and have done for many years is sort of helping governments to identify where they have subsidies to their consumers of oil and gas products, and to gasoline, to diesel, to LPG, whatever, and then to help them reform those when the um, when the situation is right and, and when we, could, we are sure that they can be done uh, politically well and uh, for sustainable development reasons. So how much change are we going to see in the level of consumption subsidies because of this oil price reduction? 
Yeah, Peter, I will, I've been thinking a lot about this. I, I think uh, countries are now stocking oil at low oil price like people were stocking toilet paper. Uh, but back to consumption subsidies, uh, at this price, of course, uh, they are going to go down and also countries should use this opportunity to reform them. And we've seen this um, scenario already uh, in 2014 at the end of the year when oil prices collapsed the previous time. And a lot of countries, over 40, according to our estimates uh, um, and the little map that we are doing, uh, were um, cutting and reforming uh, their consumption subsidies because uh, they mostly, in developing countries and emerging economies, account for the difference between the higher international benchmark oil price and the lower domestic uh, prices. So now this uh, difference is next to nothing. Uh, so our estimate would be probably at the price of $30 per barrel, um, that uh, consumption subsidies will go down from over 400 billion per year uh, in 2018 to around 200 billion per year. Uh, it's it's a very big uh, cut, but the uh, the key is for countries to ratchet these reforms because we were also seen in 2018, 2019 when oil price was was um, creeping up, that some countries started backsliding on fossil fuel subsidy reforms, and uh, some countries started reintroducing uh, those subsidies. Oh, very interesting, I think. You know, a great opportunity here for consumption subsidy reform, for big savings we saw in the past, India, Indonesia, both saving $15 billion a year when they came out of the sort of low oil prices in 2014, 2015. The other side of this, of course, is, you know, in, in the subsidy world when you know, people, governments are either being asked for consumption subsidies when prices are, are low, uh, sorry, when prices are high or they're being asked for production subsidies when prices are low. So are we now going to see in the stimulus packages and in, in other requests, um, lots of requests from companies and from corporations for production fossil fuel subsidies? Yes, and it's happening. So we've seen in Alberta, uh, in Canada, the government already injected equity and provided a loan guarantee uh, to the Keystone uh, XL pipeline. And uh, this is a classic example of what uh, I would call zombie energy, because zombie energy is only brought back to life by government subsidies. Otherwise, it's not viable. It should be dead and back in the ground. Uh, we estimated uh, that um, global fossil fuel production subsidies are around 100 billion per year. Uh, and with the calls that we hear here from the industry and um, some of the signals from the governments, unfortunately, it looks like this number is going to considerably increase in 2020. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not encouraging news because it, it doesn't feel like the right time for Alberta in Canada or for other places in the world to be sort of reinvesting back in fossil fuels. Uh, even before this crisis, the, the economics were getting increasingly poor. And it, it didn't seem like public money should really be taking that big risk of whether markets are going to go back to high prices and high demand, especially when we, we factor in you know, the Paris Agreement. You know, we're trying to get under 1.5 degrees um, as, or as close as possible. And um, the 2030, it, there's going to be a big reduction in demand uh, for fossil fuels and an ever, ever more competitive market. And I think within those sort of situations, we can probably expect a sort of prolonged period of low and volatile prices, uh, which are clearly not uh, in investors' interests at all in that market. Um, so, I mean, hopefully we'll see a, a sort of reshaping of these industries and a managed decline out of them rather than a return to business as usual. I think we've seen, you know, a few anecdotal examples of, of, of retooling, if you like, where car manufacturers have been making medical equipment, ventilators and so on. Cruise ships have been turned into hospitals and other sorts of transitions, but I think you know, a lot more has to be done. Um, you know, are, are there sort of conditions that governments can put if they're going to put stimulus packages together and, and, and help airline companies or help fossil fuel companies? Are there conditions that they can put in place to, to get them on the right track towards sustainability? 
Yeah, absolutely. They they should absolutely do it. The first condition is, of course, no layoff, layoffs because it's unacceptable for countries to get uh, bailouts, pay dividends, and lay off people at the same time. Uh, but uh, there are other things. The uh, things you mentioned um, can be fuel efficiency standards, can be diversification of business, uh, and uh, I think with government ownership and with SOEs, state-owned enterprises, uh, in a lot of developing and emerging economies, uh, governments really have uh, a lot of uh, influence on, on how the energy sector is going to develop. So one thing that's really been sort of on my mind as well is, is Who's now shaping these clean energy transitions in, in these sort of circumstances? Uh, who's going to be putting forward the fact that we need a green stimulus and we need clean energy transitions in our stimulus packages and in our economic recovery? Is it, is it the usual ministries or who, who do we need to be talking to? Well, it depends who you call the usual ministries. I want to say hi to my fellow economists and some of them higher up uh, in the uh, ministries of economy and finance, if you are listening now because uh, they are uh, forming uh, the stimulus plans. They're not necessarily thinking about um, uh, the climate implications or environmental and social implications uh, of quick uh, cash going to support the economy right now. Uh, and the good thing is that we've been talking a lot um, uh, to finance ministries, uh, ministries of economy, uh, um, about fossil fuel subsidy reform and found a lot of support because uh, when it comes to uh, mobilizing finance, uh, saving money wasted um, on fossil fuel subsidies, um, ministries of finance are always um, listening very carefully and, and uh, promoting this reform uh, agenda. And there was also a coalition of finance ministers for climate action launched last year uh, at one of the World Bank and IMF meetings. Uh, and uh, maybe you meant by the usual ministries, ministries of energy or ministries of environment that we worked a lot with. Of course, we need to support them. And there are ministries of labor, uh, ministries of social protection, ministries of health, of course, uh, that are all involved now and in dealing with this crisis. And, we require a whole of government approach. No, that's good to hear. And I think there is some, some sort of positive, some positive signs here. And it, it's also very clear, I think, from this conversation. And thank you for speaking with me today, Veta. And hopefully we'll be back in the Jiva office together sooner rather than later. Um, it's pretty clear that you know, whether these impacts on clean energy transition are going to be positive or negative is not yet set. Um, we very much hope, of course, that they will be positive. And I think uh, there's plenty of support for that case. And the more sort of evidence and views we can get out on that, the better. Um, ISD's primary focus in our energy team and, and more widely remains improving the lives of people and communities. We want to foster a fairer and more sustainable world at, at, at all times. And as we go forward, I mean, there is this real risk that we're going to lock in our energy systems to the wrong path if we don't play it right right now. And I hope we will not, and we'll be doing everything we can, including we'll be releasing a whole set of analyses, insights, recommendations over the weeks and months ahead. And I think, as, as Yvette, as you noted earlier, you know, the future is in our hands. So let's make sure we move in the right direction. And, and thank you for talking with me today. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Keep safe and healthy.